Okay. Uh, well, thanks for coming today. Uh, I'm Rob Futrick. I'm the CTO here at Cycle Computing. And uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, why are you not use uh, public cloud for your big compute and big data problems. And so basically, um, at Cycle Computing, we kind of have a fundamental belief that uh, access to compute um, creates new science and enables people to answer new questions, harder questions, uh, and basically pushes the state of the art and, uh, and helps advance everything for everybody. And uh, you know, given recent advances in cloud, we are uh, firm believers that the cloud is the way to enable compute for users. Um, and so you know, that drives our mission here, which is making compute uh, scalable in the cloud, uh, I'm sorry, productive in the cloud at any scale. And that goes from 32 cores to 3,200 cores to 32,000 and up. You know, any scale, access to compute uh, is a good thing. So we obviously talk to a lot of enterprises. We talk to a lot of different users in a lot of different places. And some of them are using cloud already, some of them are looking at it, and some of them um, have written it off, at least for now. And you know, these are a few of the reasons that we hear. Um, often we hear, well, I already own the infrastructure, so I don't need to uh, use the cloud. Um, the cloud's too expensive. It's going to cost us way too much. Uh, security in the cloud, uh, we're just not comfortable with you know, our data going over a public internet and our data residing in someone else's data center. Um, or, you know, we have data inertia. We have such large data sets uh, inside already, um, there's no possible way that we could use that in the cloud or use some kind of hybrid strategy where we're using the cloud to supplement internal resources. Um, or sometimes they say, look, we have custom hardware. We have a custom workflow. Uh, we run MPI jobs. We need low latency interconnects. Or um, we need access to GPUs or some other kind of uh, capabilities that they don't trust the cloud providers to have or to have uh, in enough scale. And then finally, uh, not so much nowadays, but, but definitely uh, a common refrain we used to hear was that the cloud is just too hard. You know, they're having enough trouble with their own internal data centers, they don't need to complicate the workflow. And often we'd hear these from uh, three basic perspectives. So you have the end users, you have the scientists and the engineers, and then you have the system architects, and finally you have organizational concerns. Um, and you know, the end user, is someone who's just trying to get their work done, and that's their main concern. And in the cloud, it's, it's trivial to get a server. Uh, it's trivial to get you know, a, a decent number of servers. There are even open source packages that'll facilitate starting cores. Um, but as we like to say, you know, starting cores is the beginning of the problem. Um, and it's a fun problem to solve, so a lot of people like to look at that. Um, but then the hard part of actually getting a workflow up and running uh, is, is often too daunting for the individual end user. Um, they're too busy with their science, you know, with their uh, risk modeling and, and other uh, work to worry about uh, onboarding their entire workflow. And then the end user, uh, you know, they have to get their data in the right place at the right time. Uh, and that's, that can be uh, a challenge to them, especially, again, uh, they're already busy with their other work. They don't need to add yet another set of tooling. Um, and learning to ex exploit unlimited compute is an interesting one. That's something that people often don't realize that they have. Uh, a problem that they have, but basically if you're used to taking advantage of the, act, uh, the compute that you have, often you'll find yourself tailoring the problems that you're trying to solve uh, and the time frames that you're trying to solve them in to the environment in which you've essentially been working. So if you have access to um, a thousand cores internally, you'll start building a mental box in which those are the kinds of problems that you ask. Uh, so learning to um, kind of retrain yourself to take advantage of you know, zero queue times and unlimited scalability uh, is really something that requires some work. And then finally, understanding your costs. You, know, you can't, um, the cloud can be incredibly cheap, as we'll talk about, um, but you still need to know how much you're spending and you still need to know, uh, are you within your budget? You don't want to have a nasty surprise at the end of the month. Then you come to the system uh, admin's perspective. So you know, the individual users have their workflow to worry about. But you, you, know, you can often have multiple environments. You have many users that you're supporting, that you're enabling uh, in the cloud. And so you uh, have to concern yourself with all the different workflows that are going on. You, know, you are trying to facilitate the science that your end users are doing, or the risk modeling, or, or design work, et cetera. Um, so your concerns are, are broader than just a single application or a single workflow. Uh, and then as with the end user, you have to manage data placement and you have to manage data access. And so security concerns come in there. Uh, and then, you know, as I mentioned, with many users, that means multiple software suites, uh, multiple workflows. Um, and then once you are trying to provide this compute, you need to work on managing it. You need to simplify access. Uh, you basically make your own life easier in supporting your end users. Um, and then you want to grow that across your organization. 
And then the same mindset shift in terms of exploiting uh, disposable and uh, uh, unlimited resources, but across cloud providers and even within a single cloud provider. Uh, and then across the world, the different regions, the different uh, zones that people offer compute. And then finally, you have the organizational perspective, uh, which is, you know, again, security. You need to make sure that only you are accessing your data, that uh, you can trust that your validated environments, that your regulated environments are going to uh, hold up in the cloud, uh, and that uh, the expenses and budgeting that you are going to incur are forecastable and measurable, and again, no nasty surprises. Um, you're going to want to manage and optimize your workflows across cloud providers and even within a single cloud provider. And then finally, you know, we see most companies as, as utilizing a hybrid strategy. People have infrastructure that they want to use. Um, and you know, some of the cheapest cores are the ones you already own. And so uh, supplementing that efficiently and easily um, is a big concern. Uh, and this does not matter, uh, you know, or this doesn't change whether you have an HPC workload or a big data workload or you, know, you name your, your kind of buzzword of choice. Uh, you have your classic HPC problems which can kind of be thought of as uh, small data creating big data. Um, and you have your new kind of workflows, uh, analytics workflows and others that you know, is big data creating small data. But the concerns are the same. You're still using compute resources and you still have to solve all of those problems. Um, so, you know, given that kind of that, that, the, the difficulty I just outlined, who is actually using public cloud for all their big data workflows and for all of their uh, HPC workflows? Um, and it's pretty much everyone. So, um, you know, the customers that we interact with are, you know, in finance, risk modeling, pricing, quantitative finance, et cetera. Um, then you have your big data customers uh, or big data uh, uh, problems, people with data lakes, you know, huge Cassandra clusters, MongoDB, and all, you know, Hadoop and Spark. Um, you know, name your tool set of choice. Uh, life sciences is huge in the cloud. Uh, everything from genomics to proteomics, to molecular modeling, comp chem, uh, you name it. And then finally, manufacturing, oil and gas, simulation. Um, you know, a lot of people write those off as traditional MPI problems. You know, you're doing uh, computational fluid dynamics, but a lot of people are solving those workflows in the cloud uh, efficiently and uh, at scale. But we're here to talk about one, spe uh, one specific use case, which is the Broad Institute. Uh, their cancer uh, program um, had some researchers that uh, had a problem their internal infrastructure was not sufficient for. Um, they basically wanted to run machine learning. They were going to use machine learning to help direct the cancer research. Uh, the traditional methods they were using were, were uh, essentially brute force and were just requiring too much compute. They needed a smarter way to look uh, for solutions. Um, they had hundreds of cancer cell lines. Uh, these cancer cell lines had information on genetic mutations that lead to cancer uh, and other problems. Um, they needed to cross-reference them and create kind of these maps among the cell lines. And uh, each one of those data sets was complex in and of itself, let alone kind of the combinatorial explosion that you get when you start mapping them. So their internal infrastructure uh, was just not uh, sufficient. Running these uh, maps for just a couple hundred samples on a single CPU was um, decades of computing, so it was completely infeasible. Um, their internal process just wasn't able to handle scaling this. And if they had stopped all of their work, if they had taken advantage of the full infrastructure that they had, um, it may have been sufficient, but that kind of coordination across the organization was not going to happen. It's too complex. <clears throat> so they came to us. Uh, and uh, came up with a cloud-only workflow. So I had mentioned hybrid and burst earlier. This one is cloud-only. Um, they were actually going to run in the Google Compute platform. Um, and they had their internal storage that contained the cell lines and other data they needed. They exposed that data via a RESTful API that uh, our workflow in the cloud was able to use to pull the data into the cloud. Now they used Google Cloud Storage to um, uh, initialize the system. They pulled the data into there. And then it was kind of a traditional batch system uh, for the actual execution. And it used Univic Grid Engine, uh, for those of you familiar with batch schedulers, as the uh, resource manager and task distribution. Now, one thing I want to note here is that in order to make this cost effective, they took advantage of Google's uh, preemptible instances, uh, which you know, they cost up to 70% less than the on-demand instances. And uh, they last up to 24 hours. If you're familiar with AWS Spot Market, they're very similar. It's basically a way of taking advantage of excess capacity in the cloud provider. Um, the, uh, the drawback is that you might lose these instances 
at any time. And so your workflow has to be amenable to that. The road workflow was extremely amenable to interruption and restarting. And so these were a perfect fit and allowed them to drop the cost uh, tremendously as we'll get to. So what were the requirements for this environment? Well, uh, it was pretty straightforward. They had one core per job. You know, we had a lot of control over how we defined the workflow to make it cloud friendly. Um, and the memory per job was about five gigabytes, which just limited the instance types we could use, but Google's capacity was well more than enough uh, for our needs. I uh, happened to use Ubuntu 12. Uh, now, um, it was internal software. It was written in R, which helps uh, remove licensing constraints, um, which is something that we can talk about um, offline. Um, and it was a scatter gather job, uh, or a diamond dag, for those of you depending on your perspective, which basically meant there was an initial job which set up the entire environment, and then a final step that gathered all the data and uh, produced the final results. <clears throat> now, as far as storage goes, each job was 200 megabytes, uh, but it was not, uh, you know, that, I think it worked out to be about 65 terabytes, but a lot of the data was shared, so it was a smaller data set, but still in the multiple terabytes. And uh, basically, uh, the end user uh, kicked off the run. We, up, we uploaded the data to the cloud. Uh, our software at Cycle um, provisioned the entire environment, installed the software, uh, automated the entire process, allowed the user to uh, not only submit the work into the environment, but manage the entire workflow as it executed and then pulled back the results. Uh, and it took care of things like encryption um, and managing the data for the end user. So uh, as far as they were concerned, it was push button. They just said go. The entire thing ran, and when it was done, our software shut down the entire environment. Uh, and this is not a one and done system. This is an ongoing solution for this user that allows them to basically take advantage of cloud resources when they need them. <clears throat> Here's an example from the dashboard uh, that shows the uh, total core count as it grew over time. Uh, and you can see the timeline down there over uh, several hours as the cluster went from nothing uh, all the way up to 51,000 cores. Uh, and then uh, as the jobs finished executing, it scaled back down. And another dashboard of the uh, workflow running, and you can see kind of the split among the work. Uh, a little bit of a heat map for uh, CPU usage for more of an admin perspective, but the user was interested to see just how uh, efficiently they were loading down the system. And then they have the final metrics. So it was about 15,000 total instance hours, uh, 243 core hour, 243,000 core hours, and 340,000 jobs for the final tally. Um, you can see a total cores at peak was just shy of 51,200, uh, and that was just shy of 3,200 instances. So there were 3,200 separate computers or VMs running in GCP uh, that produced all this work. Um, but here's the most important part. The total price was less than $5,000. So they were able to get access to a fairly massive system for what the researcher could have put on his credit card. <clears throat> and this ended up being about three decades of computing on the infrastructure he had at the time. Uh, and it took, less than, uh, took a little bit less than six hours, and again, less than $5,000 in total cost. Uh, gave him 340,000 jobs processed uh, across 51,000 cores. Um, and from the time that he realized he had this problem that was not going to be solved internally, uh, working with us and working with Google, it was less than two weeks from I need to solve this problem to I have my results. And part of that time, um, was training of the user in terms of how to use everything. So the ongoing solution is even quicker. This is a, this is a repeatable uh, process moving forward for them to supplement internal capacity. Um, and that was just one use case. You know, of all the industries I talked about earlier, you know, the Broad is just a particular life science case uh, that you know, has this need for scale, but there are many, many others. Uh, we've talked about many before. Um, so you know, I started off saying, you know, why not use the cloud for your big compute, big data workflows? Um, you know, I mentioned the reasons already. They already own the infrastructure. It's too expensive. Security is a concern. Data inertia. Uh, customized workflows, or it's too complex. Um, and as we, you know, showed through, I think the broad use case, all of those are addressed. So they had infrastructure. It wasn't sufficient. Uh, it was already being used by other users. Um, the cost. Well, the whole run cost less than five thousand dollars. That's just a, you know, that's the, that is a whole new level of compute at a whole new low price point. Uh, security. Our software took care of encryption. Our uh, software took care of all the kind of data transit. And then the big cloud providers, they deal with security to scale that, uh, that very few people um, have to deal with. And they have teams that, that, that are dedicated to that. So it's um, a level of expertise that is hard to replicate. Um, so now why would you use the cloud? You know, what, what was the benefits to the Broad and other organizations that we work with once they've overcome all those problems? Well, 
uh, the users have zero queue time. They have access to as much compute as they want, uh, as fast as they can get it. Uh, it's very simple access, it just works. And on top of that, the time that the end users used to spend on uh, IT concerns, on writing scripts, on managing workflows, on bringing up infrastructure, bringing it down, um, or internally dealing with uh, segmenting their uh, workflows from other users on the same shared infrastructure is gone. Users are now focused on the science, they're focused on the quantitative finance, they're focused on the design, as opposed to having to kind of split their focus. From the sysadmin's perspective, they've now enabled their users to access compute with zero queue time, um, but they can control that access uh, and uh, link it programmatically into internal workflows. Um, the same perspective of, of not having to focus on the wrong tasks. Their IT people no longer have to focus on dr pulling drives and checking network cables and making sure the IB interface is operating at peak efficiency. Um, they can now focus on the IT concerns of the workflows of their users. Uh, so it's a huge win for efficiency and value. Um, and they can manage the user's uh, cloud experience and they can manage the uh, compute that they're giving um, from a central location. Uh, and then data management kind of comes along with the workflow management. And from an organizational perspective, you know, you actually have, uh, in some ways, a more secure environment. You can match your budgets to the actual work being done. So you can directly map back the cost of a run to the, uh, to the researchers that ran it and, and get a better vat match between the value of the run and the work being performed. Uh, your on-demand capacity is an operating expense. It's no longer uh, an investment in infrastructure that you're going to be depreciating over time. It's not something you have to worry about using and, and uh, uh, keeping running and keeping full. It's on demand. Uh, and you can take advantage of the latest tech. Very few people are going to upgrade their infrastructure as fast as the major cloud providers. Uh, very few people are going to have access to the scale and kind of the next generation technology that the cloud providers have. Your new, your new infrastructure is great when it's new and shiny. Six months later, it's out of date. Uh, but the cloud provider's capacity is not out of date. Uh, and finally, you don't have to worry about data center optimization. That's not your business. That's somebody else's business. Let them do that. You focus on the science. You focus on finance. Um, so, more and more people are adopting cloud, more and more people are moving their workloads out there and working on some kind of hybrid strategy. Um, there are still some hard problems, so how do you get there? Uh, well, you still have to overcome making the clouds productive. So you can address all those issues, but doing it well, doing it easily, and doing it efficiently is difficult, which is why we're here. Uh, that's what Cycle does. You know, getting back to that original mission of, we want to make clouds productive uh, and useful at any scale, uh, that's what we do. So we have software that will help you provision, uh, orchestrate, manage, report, and audit uh, HPC environments across cloud providers, internal, external, et cetera. There are four sections to this. So first, you have the provisioning of the infrastructure. You want to make sure that when you bring up the environment, it is your environment. You're not just turning the power on. You're turning the power on, and then you're customizing the environment. You're setting up the storage. You're setting up the file systems. You're setting up the user's uh, software and the users themselves. And, uh, every aspect of that environment so that when it's up and running, it is ready to go. Then you have um, uh, any workflow customization, uh, any um, tie-ins to the internal environment. You want the users to push a button, and when it's ready, uh, they can start using it easily and simply. Then while it's running, you want to monitor it. You want to have the environment grow and shrink with the work that's actually being done, and you want to be able to track jobs, you want to be able to track errors, you want to be able to automatically recover uh, from anything that happens. You know, if you have an error one in every thousand boxes, well, that's fine if you only have 10 boxes or 100 boxes. But when you have 10,000 boxes, you have a measurable amount of error that you have to recover from. You do not want to push that out to your end users. And finally, when you're done using it, you want to tear it down. And you want to know who used it. You want to be able to audit that access and audit that usage so that you can then um, report back on it later. Again, very important in validated environments, regulated environments, um, and uh, uh, other similar uh, requirements. And that's where we come in. Thank you.